Welcome to Still Growing in Grace, a program dedicated to inspiring joy, giving hope, and delighting in grace. I'm Mike Zenker, and I'll be sharing with you a message of hope that will expand your understanding of God's love and amazing grace. God already deeply loves you, totally accepts you, and really, really likes you. Growing in Grace Ministries Canada and Hope Fellowship, your community church, invite you to enjoy today's program as we dig deeper into what it means to be still growing in grace. Growing in Grace. Thank you for taking time to be with me today. Uh, last week we didn't have anything going on. Uh, I was away, so uh, there was no program. Um, but today I've got a great conversation. Um, it's funny though that this conversation keeps coming up. We've talked about this once in the program before, but it's been three years. So uh, somebody else had asked about this question. What about Ananias and Sapphira? Because um, it appears that uh, God's condoning uh, killing someone for lying to God. So almost like an unpardonable sin type type thing. So what's the deal with that? And this is after the cross. So how does this work under grace? It just doesn't make sense. Although the narrative in some translations uh, laid out a certain way. So I thought, let's, let's have another go at this conversation. And um, again, if you've noticed by now, it, this isn't a Sunday school class or a college lecture or university uh, professor giving uh, factual answers. This is an exploration of, of thoughts, of perspectives that need to be considered. If you grew up in a qu pretty religious community, uh, I'd say that most of us, uh, at least myself and many others in the Western world, We've grown up in a church setting that did not allow us to question anything. And we were given clear interpretation from someone above us, so to speak, uh, of what a certain text or uh, theological idea meant. And that was not to be questioned. Um, or it was so explained, it was way over your head and you go, oh my goodness, that must be right. I can't possibly figure it out. So somebody smarter has to. <laughs> so... It's been a lot of fun here on Still Growing Grace to poke and prod and question those, those topics that really do need to be revisited. This is one of them, and we'll talk about it again sometime. But this one forced me to do a bunch of research, uh, even more research, on other ways to see the story. And my subtitle for today's uh, Still Growing Grace says, Your perspective may say more about what you believe about God than you think. So let's get into this conversation. I think you're really going to enjoy this one. Uh, comment and uh, say hello. Tell me where you're watching from. I'm watching live with you here because um, uh, I have not rewatched this since it was recorded. So I think you're going to really like it. So here we go. All right. Hello, everyone. Again, welcome to Still Growing Grace. I'm with Richard and Bill. And um, I had a question um, put past me this week. And I know we've talked about this a long time ago. Um, but it's rearing its ugly head again, and it, it falls into a set of questions that people tend to ask when the character of God seems um, inconsistent. The Old Testament, sometimes it's easier to see it, but in the New Testament, we think it's much, much clearer. And because we're finding a better, more hope-filled perspective. But the story of Ananias and Sapphira uh, keeps coming up. And maybe you got to keep talking about it over and over. And for one person, they're going to, it's going to click and have an understanding in just one conversation, but maybe it'll take 10 conversations for another person who's really trying to understand why would God kill two people about giving. And that becomes the big threat. Because if you take that story out of the new Testament, um, the church doesn't have a lot of control anymore. <laughs> like the, It just seems like a, a story that was uh, put in worded, whoever wrote it, how they wrote it. I don't know about other translations. I don't know about early writings and manuscripts yet, but it does challenge who Jesus is because I don't see Jesus acting like that at all. So why is this there and used as a threat? You better better listen up 
So I thought, can, can we get into this one a little bit? Maybe there's more tentacles on this than what I'm sharing right now. And you guys have been exposed to others. But what do you think of this is this topic to kind of dive into today? Yeah, I think, you know, it's it's definitely one of those more difficult to dissect scriptural accounts and one that has been notoriously leveraged against people as this kind of, you know, indication that we have a bipolar God. You know, you have the God that loves you and 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 wants to bless you and has grace and all these kind of things. But then, oh, by the way, don't get on his naughty side because this could happen. And I think the, the three of us, I know, would probably be in agreement that that's probably an inaccurate representation of what's going on. And we can dive into that. Um, and, and really, I think one of the things that we have to right off the bat decide when whenever we approach a piece of scripture like this, whether it's uh, New Testament or, or Old Testament related, is, is what, what are we utilizing the scriptures as? And I actually said this somewhere recently, you know, I can't remember what, but, you know, if, if all right, the scriptures aren't, and it, this may make some people uncomfortable, authoritative in, in you know, I know, in, in the sense that they have been made to be, um, that they are guiding, they are, uh, they are supporting, they are, they're good, they're inspired, but, but they aren't legalistic. And if we, the second we make them legalistic or we, we give them the authority to speak, you know, holistic truths equivalent across the board from Genesis to Revelation, we, we get in a really ugly, messy place really, really fast. Um, we have to have something bigger than the scriptures to, to weigh against. Thank God for Jesus, number one, right? Filters <laughs> number... matter? Yeah. Are you trying to say filters matter? Filters matter, right? And, and I think you know, one of the things that we've talked about here before, and I think just to reiterate is there's a there's a paradigm shift that so many people go through where we have to recognize this, this as much as we read the scriptures and we have this account where we're trying to understand what the scriptures are conveying. Just as much so the scriptures are reading us. They're exposing in us what we believe about God and what we are projecting into this story. And, and that. That's a that's a thing that I don't think is taught very often or talked about very often that with the three of us actually, I think, love to think about. And, and once you get to that, you realize that this is bringing something to the surface surface that needs to be dealt with one way or the other. We either need to accept this as God is a bipolar monster and we have to have a fear element and or we have to wrestle through this t text and find a different way of interpreting it and how it parallels to what's being uh, showcased just after the events of the cross, you know, in time. I mean, within within years, we're not talking about, you know, um, decades or centuries. We're talking about this is in the same, you know, four or five year span, probably right after the elements of the cross. And we have this unbelievable revelation of God on, on, on in Jesus. And then this happens, what's going on? So I'll just leave it at that to kind of tee up the topic. Like, this is reading us. What is it saying about us and how we interpret it? So there's really a couple ways to interpret it. So I'll leave it there and let you guys go. Yeah, I think that, uh, you know, Origen, who's one of my favorite church fathers, you know, had this belief that we should cross-examine all passages with the nature of Jesus. That's right. And he was a lawyer and, would totally grasp that. I'm sorry. And you as a lawyer would totally get that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I would dare say that Jesus's nature is the most powerful uh, cross-examination. It's the most powerful cross-examination tool and even the cross-examination, you know. <laughs> um, and sometimes, sometimes cross-examination doesn't always reveal the same thing. Sometimes it reveals this thing's a lie. Or sometimes it doesn't reveal it's a lie, but a partial truth. So yeah. I think the invitation here is for us to interject ourselves into the text and cross-examine it with the nature of Jesus. And if see, I think actually that there are several New Testament passages that are just there that aren't clear on purpose. They have gaps in them. There's gaps in this story. That it doesn't tell you the answer. It makes you engage it, engage it with Jesus and find the answer. And I think it's a relatively easy, I think it's a relatively easy passage. 
to, to get through, but it, it's the indoctrination we've had about it that makes it so hard. I think if we go back and we look at it, and just, you know, if you start off with just a couple of points, and one is that God doesn't kill people, mm -hmm. right? Death in the New Testament is portrayed as an enemy of God. It's the last enemy that will be destroyed. Jesus never killed anybody. You, you know, he, he never put anyone out of their misery. He never went around and said, well, you know, you, you're withholding from me. Bam, you're dead. All right. That, that's not the way Jesus talked, as Bill, as Bill noted. You know, and even Hebrews 2 says that Satan has the power of death, not God. I think if we have a foundation where we know that God is, doesn't kill, he didn't come to kill us, he came to save us. You remember the, you know, the Elijah called one, you know, thing where they wanted to call down fire on Samaria, uh, on the Samaritans for rejecting him. And Jesus said, whoa, you don't know what spirit you're of. I've come to save men, not to destroy men, hum humanity. So, so that would be one thing that God doesn't kill. He just doesn't. Jesus never once endorsed the stuff, never once somebody with a curse. And you think people weren't lying to him more than they were lying to Ananias and Sapphira were lying about their finances? And listen, if Ananias and Sapphira were killed because they lied about their finances, how many people in institutions, <laughs> they ought to be dropping like flies? That, that can't be what it means. It can't be. So, so uh, and then here's, here's where the cross-examination really gets good, is when you start saying, okay, why didn't Peter... Why didn't Peter follow other passages of Scripture? Why didn't Peter follow other passages that Jesus taught when, when somebody is, is caught in some sort of sinful deception? Um, you know, and, 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 and could it be that Peter misused his authority? And, and listen, I, I love Peter. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not sitting there bashing Peter, but I'm saying this. You know what? When I, when I was a young Christian, when I was a young Christian, I could see myself being a Peter going in there and saying, hey, we got to follow the Lord. We got to charge the hill on this thing. And if you're not with me, you're against me. You know, if you're not with us, you're against us. I mean, I could see, you know, the Lord's purity is so white hot, you know, that he would that you would die if you went in there with sin. You know, but I, I was a young kid, foolish, young in the spirit, zealous, zealous without knowledge, Paul called it. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it, you know, and it would be so easy to get into this, into this high thing that we've got to be white hot purity. We've got to be perfect. And if we're not, then I could be struck over dead now that, but, but if, if we cross examine it, just I'll give you a couple of passages. Uh, what about this passage where Paul says, brethren, if a person be overtaken, Galatians 6, 1, brethren, if a person be overtaken in a fault, you who are spiritual restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. Considering uh, yourself, lest you all. Well, there was no meekness here. Did they get one chance? They lie and they're out. They're dead. They're toast. You know, Matthew eighteen seven, Matthew eighteen fifteen through seventeen, uh, through seventeen tells us how you go privately to someone who's caught in a trespass. Then mm. two of you go, and then if they don't receive correction, uh, you can bring a public uh, confrontation about it, but not murder, <laughs> not killing. Um, you know, God's way is to confront with, with sin with a goal of restoration and repentance. And what about Peter? Why didn't he show the same mercy he was shown? He rejected the Lord three times. He didn't get struck dead. You know, he said there, why didn't he show them the same grace? Why didn't he get on his knees and weep and say, let me share with you. You know, I've been where you're at. I've rejected the Lord. I've been deceptive for the Lord. I mean, none of it, none of it fits. None of it, none of it, none of it, none of it fits into the nature of Jesus. Mm -hmm. So. The, the cautionary thing for me is we talk about, you know, we all three of us have talked about how you, the institution can use fear to control and manipulate. Perhaps this is a gap. And when I say a gap example, that the Lord isn't overtly telling us how to read this passage. He's testing us. This is a test of the very nature of Christ itself to get in this thing. And to do what Paul later did to Peter. Remember what Paul did to Peter? He was studying to his face. This is one time that we need to withstand Peter to his face and say, brother, you didn't, you, you weren't a vehicle in this thing of mercy. Uh, you know, I grant you that his tone acts like he was expecting the hammer to fall. Okay, I grant you that Peter's tone here is off. I grant you that. But it never at any place in this passage says that God struck them dead. It doesn't say it. Not literally. Not, but he, not, but but he let others believe that. 
Yes. And didn't correct it. Didn't, didn't channel it. Didn't, didn't divert it into mercy. He's the one that knew the Lord's mercy the most, you know, and yet he sat there in an imperious way. And, 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 and I know people will say, well, look, it said from that point on, you know, people were so people became scared, you know, people, you know, they were in the fear of the Lord and that they would bring sick people into Peter's shadow. Now that, that preliminarily looks like a good idea, but let me ask you, is mm. this more an issue of worshiping Peter? Is this where maybe the popery of the whole thing started? Oh, let's bring yeah. him to Peter's shadow. You know, he just struck a man dead. He has the power of life and death. Is, is this Peter being elevated rather than mm. the body of Christ working mercy and, and redemption and restoration to an individual? I know I'm talking a lot, but I mean, I, I just, but I feel it's across the definition that, this is this can be so beneficial if we can do it in an obvious case like this, then we can start cross examining other passages in the New Testament that maybe don't resonate. That's yes, exactly think, it. Yeah, I think there's things there for us to learn. I wonder if if God foreknew this, haha, uh-huh, and that's why Paul was appointed, right? Because Good because Peter pulled a Moses. Moses when he came down the mountain. He revealed his ego by saying, how long must God and I put up with you? He moved himself into the place of equal instead of a leader. And Peter could easily, in his immaturity, have bought into that. We see it happen all the time. This shouldn't be new. And yet people won't think about that and read uh, just a a black and white copy of the text and think, oh, that's what this means. But we have to play in and read the humanity going on here and the pattern of Peter. If you look at anybody that's wise in in our own lives, people that we would go to for some advice, they've been through hell and back. They've had immaturity. They've had much grace and mercy shown to them. And it's later, after much growth, that their words actually have power. Here, Peter, this brand freaking new, a late teenager, who knows, right? Like, would you put somebody in charge of an entire, I don't know. yeah, I, th- I think there's so much. One of the things I wrote, wrote here, I think there's two cool elements that are that are unique to what we I would call the Christian faith. Uh, number one is transparency. We have the story, right? It's not like it was omitted. It's not like it was buried. It was hidden underground. Like, oh my gosh, we have this. We have this thing that's transparent out there, which we're able to have this conversation and and have this cross examination. You know. A rig trial wouldn't allow this, right? A rig system wouldn't wouldn't give us something that makes us, rig, you know, wrestle through this. Uh, number one. The other one is, I think, again, we we as twenty first century Christians who have two thousand years of orthodoxy and you know veneration that's happened with all these guys like Peter and Paul and John and all these guys and. We, we've put a deification on the scriptures, A. we put a deification to some degree, just like you guys are saying, under Peter's shadow. We've we've elevated him to some sort of Pope-like figure. And, and we, we have to kind of sometimes step back and go, okay, who were these guys? Well, number one, he was a fisherman, <laughs> right? He, he was a, a religious zealot, we're pretty sure, right? He had some sort of eschatology that was expectant. Of a, of, of a violent kingdom. He was carrying around a sword and his last actions, he cut off the ear of a guy that came to arrest Jesus, right? So he was confused all the way up until the cross that we're going to go, we're going to battle for Jesus, right? He gets a, the script flipped on him 180 degrees, right? Jesus pours his grace out after he denies him three, three times. He restores him three times. He's a per, person in process. And he's like, yeah, you're going to be, you know, a guy who's going to go baptize the world, immerse the world in this good news that God looks like me, right? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, go and share this Trinitarian love and immerse the world in the grace that I've shown to you. And he goes out there, he's all excited, and all of a sudden, it's a it's a shit show. <laughs> I was thinking that. <laughs> right? <laughs> Romans are after him. The Jews are after him. He's got some people who have seen Jesus. He's trying to put structure and figure out this. I mean, if you were put into this situation, how are you going to act? Right. And we see it in small churches. We see it in places in our own culture, kind of in, in I think, microscopic or or microcosmic uh, display where you get something that's really organic and honest and beautiful 
and all of a sudden it gets momentum and then it gets a little bit uncomfortable because it's a little out of control and you're getting people to show up that are saying things that probably aren't something that you really agree with and say, okay, gotta, gotta put some rules in place and same thing. And all of a sudden what was something really harmonic and organic and beautiful is kind of getting a little difficult. It, this is where we're at. It's beautifully transparent and we can, we can step back and realize this isn't necessarily a story about God as much as it is it's about the human journey still processing through what it means to take on this identity of being a son, a son made in the image of Christ. I'm not the Christ, but I have access to this. It's beautiful and it's also completely nuts. And, and we're given a glimpse into it and we're not alone. <laughs> we're, we're going down the same roads and making the same mistakes. And, you know, we see someone drop dead in our church in a tragic accident, maybe. Our first instinct, maybe, what did they do? Oh, I'll bet we're back to back. We're back to this whole paradigm where maybe God didn't. Mm, did they give enough? Uh, let's just blame it on that. Right. And. And how easy would it be to do, or how easy is it for us to do that over and over and over again? And I think that may be kind of what's going on here. And I think you're right, Richard. We have to step back and go, wait a second, is this true or is this not true? And that's hard because you've been told scripture's infallible, scripture's inerrant, it's there. This means it's the truth. Well, it's the truth of how they interpreted it, but is it the truth compared to Jesus? And that's that's hard for people who have been told that they're not allowed to have that conversation or they've been given the freedom to, to talk to Holy Spirit within them and start to, to re-examine these things from new light and new angles. And, and see, that's where the principle of intertextuality becomes in, because that says you, you don't read a scripture in isolation. You, mm -hmm. you, other scripture, you have to reconcile and bring in other scriptures. So the other scriptures that reveal these things we know about Jesus's mercy and about restoring someone, about being patient with them, endlessly patient with them, about being meek with them, about confronting them, about helping to restore them in, in all things. I mean, you know, Paul had his own little version of this. You know, in, 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 in the beginning, you know, the guy that cheated on his mother-in-law, I mean, uh, he had a uh, first Corinthians, right? Mother-in-law. And, um, and, and then Paul was talking in First Corinthians about excommunicating them and, you know, how sinful it was. And you can't let that thing. But then you go to the second, you go to the second Corinthians letter and Paul's apologetic about it. He said, I overspoke. He said, I, I, I realize how much pain I've caused you here, how much how much uh, discomfort. And I'm sorry, receive. So he suffered enough. Receive him back. Hmm. All right. So we all have these wrath hiccups, these wrath verbs. We think those who, you know, again, when I was young, uh, I haven't told you all many, many stories about uh, when I was in a cult. I was in a cult for a year. And in this, in this cult, uh, my spiritual dad got involved with it while I was in seminary. When I came back, they had joined this organization out of North Carolina. And they were extremely legalistic, but they were powerful. If you sat there and listened to them, they were powerful. But they were talking about everything was Old Testament. Everything was condemnation. Everything was, you know, the problem with people in church. They don't receive correction. We're here to give you correction. So what they really were doing was calling our wills. They were saying, you know, worship our wills. And that how ridiculous it got was that the, the leader gave, came out and publicly repented because there was a, a, a root beer out in the, in the lobby that had a pitcher uh, on the, a can of root beer that, came through the machines, the drink machines, that had a picture of a bar on the machine, you know, and like root beer, a, a floaty root beer on it. So because it showed a bar, she repented and felt like that was a sin. But see, this, this if y'all could have seen this church service, you would have said this would be the type of people that could literally condemn someone to death. If you were caught in this, they would used to circle up. They would circle up if you were caught in sin and scream. Right. Uh, they would have shouting prayer. You may have heard about, yeah, I mean, that was some Pentecostals and Charismatics did that, but not like this. And actually, Inside Edition went inside that church and got a video of them screaming over kids. And uh, that's another story. I was, I was already out of it. Thank God the Lord pulled me out of it. Thank God and pulled, and pulled me into grace and pulled me into the love and, and the true nature of Jesus. But I remember when I was there, every little transgression, you felt like the hammer was going to fall. Every little transgression was life or death. Mm -hmm. and, and that's this same, the, the same imperious, legalistic, 
venomous, fang-bearing identity. Um, I mean, I, I saw a meme the other day about a girl talking. It was from a movie, uh, uh, Liberal Arts is the name of the movie. It's a 2012 movie. But the girl is talking to her boyfriend, and she's saying, all you do is talk about things you hate. You think that's that's interesting. It's not. It's boring. Talk mm. about what you love and don't talk about the things you hate. Well, this cult that I was in all, only talked about things I hate. Hated. And I think you see that in this Ananias and Sapphira. Where was the God of love? Where was the love of God in this? They were talking about what they hated. You're withholding money from us. We're suffering. The church is suffering. And I think Bill's right. There, there, there was a pivot there. You know, there was a pivot, a bad pivot that happened away from God into man, into man elevation. And um, and I think that we all, but, but the bottom line is we all are works in progress. We all haven't explored our mercy fountains. We, we eat, I believe this, I believe these people in the cult had mercy fountains, but they had covered the fountains up. You know, Isaac, uh, uh, Isaac's wells were covered up by the enemies. And I think that's an allegory of, of how our wells of mercy can be covered up on these mm. things. We have to cover each other. And if you see wrath and a blind spot in me, and I'm acting wrathfully, think, processing wrathfully, my tone is wrathful. Then as my brothers, you, you would confront me and say, look, I just don't bear witness with the tone of what's going on here. You know, we love you. You know, <laughs> breathe deep. Catch, you know, catch up with this thing. Catch your breath with it. And that's what we're here for. To, to I can see maybe blind spots in you. You can see blind spots in me. How much more so when these believers were there? Why didn't so, where was the person that withstood Peter to his face? And they just let him control the show. And, you know. Uh, I, I'll never forget reading that. Uh, I think it was Queen Queen Mary. I think someone was so scared of him, uh, of her, that they came and they died right in front of her because they were scared that he, she was about to condemn them. So Peter putting on a demeanor here of condemnation. Condemnation kills. I am telling you, it kills our kids. It destroys their thoughts. It makes them want to cut themselves. It makes them want to hate themselves. Condemnation is is. You know, apart from whether Satan is an angel or not, Satan represents to me the idea of condemnation. Absolutely. And, and he also yeah. death. He is the death angel. He kills the concept of satanic energies kill by condemnation. That's their number one. Condemnation and fear and accusation. Those are the ways in which we're spiritually killed and then physically killed, too. But, you know, th those are the enemies. And, and the young church wasn't experienced enough, right, in, in this particular situation to deal with it. And but and so so I, I think it, I praise God that story is in the Bible. I used to hate it, but now I love it because it's there for us to to look past the limitations that that that, you know, that we stand on their shoulders. OK, yeah. we we keep getting this idea that that, that, that you know, we, that, that they see farther, that they stand on our shoulders. No, they don't. <laughs> they, they're, they're the foundation. We, we stand on their shoulders so we can see farther and we can see wider. And we, we build on the good things that they saw, the good things that they did, which Peter and Paul both did. You know, they were struggling with these things, but you see it in the writings. You know, one time, you know, Paul gets a little wrathful, but then he's always quick to apologize, always quick to say, I didn't mean to cause you any sorrow, you know. Um, and, and I think if we could just be the same way and not be scared, of, you know, with somebody once asked me, well, who do you who do you think you are to challenge Peter? Who do I have to be? You know, I, 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 I love Jesus. He's my Lord. I, I, the last thing Jesus would want me to say is I can't dare say anything about Peter. I can't dare disagree <laughs> with him or Paul. I'm telling you, I, I'm more confident with Peter than Paul. But I, I, <laughs> Paul, I mean, with Paul and Peter, but uh, uh, I'm, but I, I, I know that Paul would want us to go beyond where he went. I think Paul is the quickest I've ever seen to admit he was wrong and, and, and to acknowledge that he needed that this was, you know, he was even gutsy enough to say, well, this isn't the Lord saying this. This is my call. That's right. You know, and that's the way we need to be. And, and had they had that humility, there was a lack of humility. I didn't I didn't see any humility in Peter. Or the, that's right. Or meekness. Did you see it? I mean, there's no meekness there. So my, my back to your comment of who are you to challenge Peter, if somebody would say that to you, um, it reveals what Bill was talking about. Our, our presumption of interpretation, what we, how we see the scriptures. Many of us have never been challenged to revisit the authority of scripture, the infallibility of it all, which I think are huge 
huge factors that need to be revisited honestly in a careful setting, not combative. But when you begin to um, question your own, what you thought were pillars and realize, wait, I've been reading the scripture through the lens of inerrancy that was given to me by some denomination or some historical father that who, who also was believed it fully, but wait a minute, go back to the lens of Jesus. Who, who brings us back to the lens of Jesus, Jesus. And there's been snippets all through history to bring us back to that foundation. Amen. Well said. Yeah, no, I mean, for me, you know, that, that, the, probably that keystone moment was, uh, Hebrews 1, 3 just happens to be the verse, you know, that Jesus is the exact representation of God. Mm-hmm. And that, that I don't know, a little, probably 12, 12, 15 years ago, just stopped me in my tracks from everything that I had been taught since I was born. I was born into the Christian church, you know, and, and it was shocking. Here I am in my early 30s, and I just have this, this moment of, wow, it's so fundamentally simple. And yet I that's a concept that had never been brought forth in my thinking through 30 years being in the church. 30 years. And that Jesus is the perfect representation. He is the perfect image of what I need to think about first when I think about God. Then everything filters past that. And and how... If that if that's anti-Christian or if that's and I it's it's shocking to me how that is the egregious tone that you get from some people who will push back saying no 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 scripture is but that that I can elevate Jesus to this level of preeminency and that's seen somehow as heretical. I, I don't understand that. I don't think I ever will at this point. That's time. brilliant. That's brilliant. And and, and I yeah. I think you know, I try to imagine if 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 we were God, and I and I'm trying to lead somebody into a personal relationship, would I give them a, a writing that would help them? Yes, but would I give them a writing that I would that would they would come to ultimately worship and consult and not get to know me? Yeah. So so what would I do to keep that from happening? I I would put traps in the scriptures. So that it would eventually, when you get mature enough, when you mature enough in the spirit, you'll start to see these are like te- these are like uh, quizzes that are yeah. throughout the Testament. <laughs> We're being quizzed on how well we know the Holy Spirit. And I've said this before, but, you know, uh, the Holy Spirit doesn't test us on Bible knowledge, um, never tests us on Bible knowledge, but Bible knowledge tests us on spirit knowledge. Yeah. How well we know the Holy Spirit. That's it. So, That's so it. Th- quizzes this is one of the big quizzes revelation's a big quiz a huge uh, quiz yep yeah and, but it, the answer- I, and jesus jesus gave those quizzes non-stop that's what the parables were the parables weren't necessarily our authoritative truth they were a lot of times big hanging questions left unanswered yes yes right and they're like dealing with some sort of generalized topic of secular knowledge farming kingdoms and he just leave them hanging and then be like, uh, and it's up to you to figure out, is this indicative of what you've believed in the past or what this new kingdom coming is supposed to be revealing to you? You get to decide. And, and wouldn't it make <laughs> sense, wouldn't it make sense that he would wean that God would wean us off the scripture, off the literalism? Right. You yep. know, it's there's still precious scripture lives in me. I mean, when it says that it's written on our heart, it really is. Once you look, once you look at it, once you catch the flavor of it. In, in Jesus's nature, it stays, it's in you 24 seven. But, but what, in terms of the written story itself, people are, are chained, ball and chained to that story as though the conclusion is obvious. It's anything but obvious. <laughs> and, but, but only one, only one point's obvious and that's Jesus leading to the cross and being resurrected. That's the only obvious part. Yeah. <laughs> Everything and, else is superfluous. But see, here's the, here's the subtle thing. Here's what people, <laughs> Doing it's the same universalism. They look at a handful of passages and ignore dozens of other passages. Mm-hmm. All right. If Ananias and Sapphira were all you had about God, maybe you could go there. Maybe you could go there. Mm-hmm. Much about Jesus and the rest of the New Testament to know that doesn't pass muster. So it's a red flag that we are supposed to look at 
until we see Jesus in it. And when I see Jesus in it, I see, you know, Peter, you know, these these were flawed people doing the best they could. You know, I, I've been the same way. But, I, you know, the situations where I was at, thankfully, life and death of somebody else wasn't an issue. And Bill, just to use another example, you know, Wesley, uh, we've shared this many times, but, you know, Wes, Wesley was around some Calvinists who said that That's right. a, a particular a pastor who was Armenian and they didn't like what he was teaching. The child, his child drowned while crossing the river. Well, these Calvinistic pastors said, well, he, the father deserved it because of it. He was teaching false doctrine. And Wesley just was, you know, just taking it. Yeah. And he said, he said, your God is my devil. You know, the thing, what you just said is of the devil. All right. Whatever the devil is, what you just said is of it. And that's that God would strike. And here we sit in the irony. And granted, we have Calvinists in our world and we have Wesleyans in our world. And then we have some people that have shoved the two of these things together, which never were harmonious to begin with. That were actually antithesis to one another and created this new thing that's between the two that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. And we have we just have tremendous confusion, I think, and especially in the Western side of the world when it comes to things like the goodness of God. And that's kind of crazy and yet it's pervasive but that's well, the yeah, and, oh, i'm sorry you go ahead no no i was just going to say remember too when we we talked the other week about jesus saying my father judges no man and mm -hmm. then jesus, all judgments is given to me but i judge no man <laughs> that's right. right i've come to save the world not to judge it so so here we are t going against jesus's teaching he doesn't judge people this way we think that ananias got judged right then and there by god and struck dead when Jesus said over and over again, his father and he are the ones doing the judging. All right. That we are judging, we are judging ourselves with a condemnation. We are letting, we are letting uh, Peter or or allowing maybe someone else, someone else to judge us, right? Satan, yeah. each other. But yeah, not God. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's condemnation, it's death by condemnation. And it says <laughs> that it, it says in Revelation that uh Satan condemns us, you know, all the time, 24-7. He condemns us, all right? He is the spirit of condemnation. He is the dynamic of, of, of condemnation. But where there's no condemnation, then peace can enter, peace mm -hmm. and affiliation and correction. I mean, don't you think Ananias and Sapphira, they might have loved them out of this thing? Absolutely. You know, of, of withholding? Is this really that big an issue? It's really, it's, it's not. It's really not, and again, probably a whole different topic for a different day, but it's it's really not unlike Judas in many ways. I was thinking that, right? Judas, Judas's betrayal caused him to inflict his own self, you know, harm, death, suicide, whatever. Um, and and the disciples, if we read it, to me, it's another red herring kind of like red flag moment when the disciples condemn Judas repeatedly through the Gospels. And, and I've been softened going, wait a second. I don't think they had come to a place, even when they wrote the Gospels, that they were seeing Judas through the eyes of Christ anymore. They were just so mad about what he did that they still had a little bit of vengeance toward that, that betrayal. But the reality is, you know, Jesus adored Judas. Whether we can understand that or not, he gave, greeted him with a kiss in his last moments. He and washed it, his feet, too. He washed his feet. And he, there was mercy abounding upon mercy on Judas from the cross and beyond. Amen. And, and, and the scriptures don't necessarily give us a glimpse into that. And, and I know that because I know Jesus now. <laughs> I know the heart of Jesus. Um, but if we strictly think and only look at Judas through the scriptures, then we can, we can contort that and see that through a more perverted lens and justify that lens if we so want. I like how you said, oh, go ahead, Richard, please. No, no, I was just going to say the term giving up the ghost, that's a very curious yeah. term. It's in there three or four times in the New Testament. One time is with Ananias and Sapphira. And it's, I think there's a, someone who's condemned to death can give up the ghost, can, can die. When Jesus was on the cross, he gave up the ghost. Mm -hmm. All right. Herod, when Herod is exposed, when he claims to be a God, and then the worms, you know, Josephus talks about the worms eating him up. And it says he gave up the ghost. These are people to die of this. I believe to die from despair is giving up the ghost. Mm -hmm. that, that means that there's some voluntary aspect of it. Now with Jesus, it was a little bit different. He gave up the ghost, but he also bore the despairs, you know, man of sorrows mm -hmm. and all that. Um, so I, I think there is at least phys his physical death. 
Um, well, and so I think I, even in his physical death, he bore the full condemnation of all humanity, all Adam. And and yes, it, it, it killed, killed him. They yeah. killed him. I like how you um, mentioned that Paul said something in First Corinthians and then apologized for it later. I never caught that before. Um, but I, it's making me think that I think Peter did the exact same thing. He never apologized, but his maturity showed up in Second Peter 1. Yeah. When he shows a progression of journey, a, a journey of growing. I usually talk about it when I speak about forgiveness. And um, uh, I speak to you children because you, oh, yeah. you know you're forgiven. Well, he's speaking, he's talking child level. And how many people believe they're adult, mature Christians who do not believe they're Christian, or sorry, they're forgiven. And yet Peter's saying, that's child. If you don't even know that, you are you are a child. And that blew me away. And at the end of that passage of chapter one there, the one section he gets through when he talks about the progression of godliness leads to this, um, uh, kindness and gentleness leads to this. Then you'll grow to have love for fellow Christians. Mm -hmm. And then you will grow. And I love this in the New Living Translation says, then you will grow to have a genuine love for everyone. That was not on display with Ananias and Sapphira. So he has grown up a lot. Was that after the confrontation with Paul? I don't know. But if there's, if we could, if we could at least give progressive revelation some thought and some value that it has a place on the menu uh, for the lens of seeing all this. I think there's some room here to say, Hey, we got to be careful how hard fast did we get on clobbering people with Bible verses and extend love instead. So. Yeah. Amen. Well said. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yep. Anyway, that's all I got right now. Our time is up, but that was, I think that this is going to be an encouraging discussion for a few people. Cause even the, the group that, uh, are you all in the Jesus Unchained group by now? I am now. Yeah. I think Richard, you might be, if you're not, I'm going to send you a request. The Jesus Unchained deconstructing, um, uh, here, what's it called? Deconstruct from dead religion without losing your faith. If you, if you don't have that link, I'm going to send it to you to be, oh. join the group. This is a safer group of people honestly deconstructing and looking for a better lens. This topic is one of those lenses. So yeah. we have people from all kinds of backgrounds. You, there, you can't, there's no harshness allowed in this group. Um, you can't um, belittle or anything. You can't be trying to be more right than everyone else. It's, 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 it's monitored quite well. But I, th- I find authentic people in this group. That's why I invited, you know, Build in and Richard. I think I did send you something way back. But um, this group, I think, is going to really enjoy this conversation because it adds hope that there is a better perspective than what they've been told. So mm. that's my hope for all these conversations. Well, you know, and, and to not be afraid of Scripture. One of the whole problems with it, it fosters fear. If mm. you worship it and you say, but the dead letter of it has to be obeyed or else. If we have an or else type of thing, it's fear based. And even though there's a part of us that loves the Lord and still can hear the Lord with there's fear, you know, there's 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 condemnation. And, and it's just never going to it's not going to go smoothly. It's going to be it's going to be just roller coaster back and forth, up and down and uh, just the elimination of fear. And when we read these scriptures with courage, with Jesus, mm-hmm. courage, I guarantee you it's only going to paint God as beautiful. Yeah, you're in the group. I just checked. <laughs> OK. Well, I thought it sounded familiar. Yes. Yeah. Very good. Well, thanks for the time today and having a conversation, guys. Uh, I look forward to the next topic as we um, head towards the summer and see what topics will come up. I like the switching of topics because um, each of us bumps into somebody that has a question. It turns out it's not just a question for one person. Other people are asking the questions too. So Mm -hmm. we're not the answer people, but we're sure having fun having the discussion (laughs) looking for a better perspective. That's right. So. Answers, the answers blossom, you know, and they keep yeah. blossoming beyond where we're at. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Thanks, guys. That was fun. All right. My goodness. I hope you enjoyed that. If you jumped in late and didn't hear the whole conversation, go back and rewatch from the beginning. Uh, it was a really good discussion. Um, and I hope it offers some hope because uh, if, if, if you, in even a small way, think there's room for a really ticked off God in your theology, you have more to learn. I have more to learn. Um, Even the the temptation to 
to think, you know what, there is a way to misbehave and get uh, judged or punished by God. Um, if you've not heard this yet, I think it was Baxter Kruger, Paul Young, or who else? There's a whole bunch that's, uh, that communicate this lens, Brad Jerzak. It's not God that punishes us. It's sin. Our mistakes punish us. When we're driving too fast down the road and get pulled over, we think, oh, what did I do wrong? Or we crash our car because we're going too fast. It's, it's, it's our errors that usually are the cause of all this stuff, and that's what punishes us. So our, uh, unlearning this idea that... God is true agape, true love, and that like what Richard was saying in the uh, and Bill were saying in the conversation that God doesn't judge, Jesus doesn't judge. What, why are we so good at judging then? Like we're professional judges in our Western world and our religion stuff. My goodness. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that, and uh, I look forward to seeing what the next one uh, will be. Uh, thanks for those that are watching and commenting. Um, yep. And buddy, thanks for all your comments there. I didn't have a chance to jump in on all that. Uh, I have to take off this morning, so that's why I got to wrap this up. Otherwise I'd go through and read your comments. Um, thank you for those that are watching online. Um, make sure you let me know where you're watching from because it's always fun to know. And, uh, otherwise we'll catch you next week or so. And, uh, I believe next Wednesday, 8am still growing in grace because none of us have arrived. See you then. Join me next time on Still Growing in Grace for more good news. Enjoy previous episodes by downloading our podcast at growingingrace.ca. You can also visit hopefellowshipycc.com to find our service times and location. If this show has been an encouragement to you, please consider making a donation today at growingingrace.ca and help us keep spreading this good news. Thank you again for tuning in to Still Growing in Grace.